This week on The Gadget Show. Oh, my God. <laughs> we test multimedia phones in stunt planes. <laughs> Night vision goggles in a field. <laughs> and sat-navs in a rally car to discover how they perform under pressure. And I test one of the most extreme off-road gadgets I've ever seen. The ridiculous Dirt Surfer. Welcome to The Gadget Show. Let's get straight down to business. The business of Gadge. This week's big challenge for Jace and I was to test an array of cutting-edge technology, but with the added twist that we'll be using different forms of transport. It's a challenge that we call planes, trains and automobiles. Yeah, and first up, unsurprisingly, is the planes bit. We'll get to what that's all about in a second. But most importantly, let's talk about what we were testing. These. Two of the best multimedia phones on the market. Forget the iPhone, when it comes to multimedia phones, we feel these are the best you can get. I was using LG's latest phone, the Stunning Beauty. It's got a gorgeous touchscreen and a 5 megapixel camera with autofocus, Xenon flash and photo editing built in. Instead of Wi-Fi, it comes with HSDPA, which means download speeds of up to 2 megs. But if there's a phone to beat it, it's this, my Nokia N82. I've been using it for a few months now and I absolutely love it. Its 5 megapixel camera is the best I've ever seen on a phone. It shoots video and it's got Wi-Fi. For our challenge, we went to Cywell Aerodrome just outside Northampton, home of the Blades Aerial Stunt Display Team. Look, if I can just contain my excitement long enough to actually speak, I will tell you that we're about to test the multimedia capabilities of our two phones by taking part in a half-hour aerial stunt display in those. The idea is that while we're up there, we become bloggers, so we're going to take photos, write text about what we're experiencing at that moment. We're then going to post it onto the Gadget Show website real time, yeah. and we've just got half an hour, don't forget, to do it all in. It really is a great test of the multimedia functionality of our two handsets, both in terms of their connectivity and their usability. We were both already very familiar with our phones, and so once we'd slipped into our flight suits and practised our parachute landings, Ready. it was out to the planes and chocks away. We'd be judging the phones on ease of use, the quality of the pictures they produced, and just how easily they allowed us to get the stuff we needed up onto the web. <laughs> And as soon as we were up in the air, our X-Red Arrow pilots started doing their stuff and our task began. Oh, my God. OK, we'll get a picture of that. That is so scary. That's Jason above me and he's upside down! Wow! This is wrong. First up, we had to use our phones to take some photos, a job me and the beauty attacked with relish. It's one of those camera phones that you think is as much a camera as it is a phone. Oh, my God, they've just spawned up. I've got to take a picture of this. Nokia have been producing excellent camera phones for years, and my N82 is no exception. As you can see, it's got Carl Zeiss optics and a 5-megapixel camera, so the pictures, the clarity of the pictures, should be really good. The LG VT is packing 5 megapixels as well, but when you put the pictures from the two cameras side by side, it's clear that the Nokia's photos are better quality. So, with our photos taken, the next task was to type some words and get blogging. Trying to do this in a plane, being thrown around the sky, was always going to test the usability of the phones to the max. Right from the off, I found the N82 incredibly easy to use and very easy to navigate. So, I choose which picture I want. There's a little envelope that asks me if I want to mail it. I click on that, I write some text. This is fabulous. Whereas I was having a few problems with the Beauty's touchscreen. Well, this keyboard is proving actually quite tricky. I'm only on my fifth word at the moment. The problem is that in anything but steady situations, a touchscreen will never be as tactile and easy to use as real keys you can feel with your fingers. OK, I'm going to send a nice quick one, otherwise I'm, I fear I may not get one away. I got my blog done first, but within a few minutes, Jason had finished his and both blogs were popping up on the Gadget Show website. Don't you just love tech? Oh, my God, here we go. As the flying got even more extreme, ah! we both moved on to testing the video capabilities of our phones. OK. Oh. The video quality of this phone is near DVD. That would be amazing if that was true, so I'm going to check it out. 
and I wasn't disappointed. The video was really sharp with accurate colours. The camera's really easy to operate. It's got a 120 frame video, which they very thoughtfully enabled you to activate via a physical button on the side, so not a software touchscreen button. This allows you to produce glorious, super slow footage like this. Just look at those gorgeous shots. Really impressive. Overall, both phones produced excellent video pictures. Oh. My God! Unfortunately, despite spending hours in this very plane on a flight simulator, the real thing eventually proved too extreme for me. Smoke off, go. As Jason became reacquainted with his lunch, me and my N82 returned victorious to the ground. Throughout the task, it had produced the best pictures and had been by far the easiest and most intuitive to use. Yeah. Wow! Oh, that was such an incredible experience. Absolutely it really was. phenomenal. Forget roller coasters, that is where it's at. Oh, I loved it. You loved every minute of it, didn't you? Yeah. I think it's fair to say that Susie and her N82 won that first part of the challenge. Oh, yeah, but don't forget, that is only the first part of the challenge because it's planes, trains and automobiles, so we've still got second part and the third part oh, still yeah. to come. OK, so don't count me out yet. You're going to see a resurgent Jace in the latter part of this show. Yet we'll be testing out some impressive night vision goggles and entry-level in-car sat-navs. And later, I'll take to the grassy slopes on the dirt surfer, a gadget that promised to either give me a very big rush or break my bones. Time to return to this week's challenge, planes, trains and automobiles, so-called because it involves planes, trains and automobiles. Why? Because they're great places to test cutting-edge gadgetry. Yet our first part of the challenge was to test multimedia phones whilst playing in stunt planes, and I won that part of the challenge with my Nokia N82. You certainly did, Suze, and after I'd recovered and had a lie down for, you know, a couple of hours, uh, we were ready for part two of the challenge, which, we were told, involved train spotting. Yeah. But because this is the gadget show, we knew it was going to be a bit more than sitting on the platform of a station with an anorak eating sandwiches watching locomotives go by. You say that as if it's wrong. In fact, this task took place in the dark and the trains we had to spot were seven toy trains all hidden around a field. To spot them, we would be using night vision goggles and finding tiny trains would test just how good they were. Amazingly, you can get a really good pair of night vision goggles now for just a few hundred quid. But there are a few on the market. So if you do want a pair, and I know that you do, which ones <laughs> should you go for? We recommend you should go for first generation technology because anything after that is prohibitively expensive. We're talking thousands. So what we've got to test are two examples of first generation NVGs or night vision goggles mm -hmm. to you and me. Uh, and we're going to put them to the test. I'm testing the brand new Cobra Storm Pros. With a very tough all metal body shell, they're built to operate in low light, but have a short range infrared illuminator built in to help in total darkness. There's no magnification, so they don't change perspective, and that should allow me to move around easily. I've got the even cheaper Yukon Tracker MVGs. They're a bit bigger than Suze's, but they have an easy grip, a rubberized casing, and they're water resistant. Like the Cobras, they've also got an infrared illuminator and don't magnify what you see. So, we are standing in a very large dark field. Uh, over here is a miniature train with a train driver and the lovely Amy on the back. Now, Amy is going to be holding up names or numbers on a little placard. Those names and numbers correspond to little miniature toy trains that are down there sitting on straw bales. We've got to find as many as we can and bring them back here. Whoever brings back the most, obviously, is wearing the best night vision goggles. So, with our goggles powered up and all the cameras filming us switched to night vision, we were ready for the off. Go train. Three, two, one, go! So, number 6291 was the first toy train we had to find. This is a great test of these MBGs because to win, not only will we need to be able to move freely and easily around the field, but we'd also need to read some very small writing on some very small trains. If either of these sets of goggles were just showy tat, we'd soon find out. No, that's not what I want. I want 6291. And right from the start, we were both having problems with focusing. What's difficult about these? is that they, you have to focus them continually on the move. So it's very difficult to actually look at a little train like this and I have to refocus so that I can actually find another bale like this one over here. 
At least Jason had one simple control for refocusing his goggles. My Cobras have got separate focal controls on each side, and that means it's a two-handed job and very, very fiddly. The problem is they're quite a specific focus, so right now I'm just walking in a blurred manner towards what I think is a straw bale. It is. After a bit of a search, I found the first train. I got it! I found it! One to me. Next train, GB825. Inside night vision goggles are image intensified tubes. Whatever light is out there, moonlight, starlight and infrared light, is fed into the tube through the goggles lenses. The tubes then intensify the light to a level where it produces a monochrome image that we can see. The image is green as a result of the substance used to intensify the light. I got it! GB825! Sorry, Suze. 2-0 to Jason, and I was not happy. How's it going? Not so good. No, it's hopeless. We'd both already seen train MY276 and remembered where it was, so this round became a straight race, which was a great test of how easy it is to move around the fields with these goggles on. And again, Jason's Yukons proved easier to use. My Cobras just didn't sit very well on my eyes, which made it much more difficult to see where I was going. Got it! I got it! <laughs> Three nil to me. And with just seven trains to find in all, if I got the next one, it would all be over for Susie. What does that say? I was really starting to enjoy my Yukons. I was getting to grips with the focus and loving the clarity of the night vision. The other good thing about these, because they've got this single cup around the eyes, they block out all the ambient light, so you get this kind of almost like a monocular feel. It's really good, which means that they're hands-free. And pretty soon, me and my Yukons had found the fourth train. I got it! I got little Spencer! Oh. Meaning a unanimous landslide, undisputed win for me. Well, no wonder I was having such problems and not like the Neanderthal woman with all my brow pushed down like that. These are twice as they heavy are. as the Yukons. They are. The Yukons are incredibly light. And I reckon that if all you're after is an inexpensive pair of night vision goggles for looking at wildlife, you know, like badgers or whatever it is that you look at <laughs> at night, um, these Yukons are absolutely brilliant. But don't forget, still to come, the final part of planes, trains and automobiles as we test in-car sat-navs. We're going to go very fast round a rally track to see how easy they are to programme. Right now, though, it's time for this week's focus group. Each week on the focus group, John, Jason and I present the best gadgets that we can find in a particular category to our focus group and they tell us which one they like the best. Now, this week, I think it's fair to say that we have really excelled Definitely. ourselves. We've found the most amazing ways of controlling your computer and our gang today is made up of business and IT and electronic experts. And, John, you're up first. Well, I've got a thing called the light glove. I know it doesn't look much like a glove. It's actually something you put around your wrist, but you can use it to replace a mouse and a keyboard. And I'd like someone to help me demonstrate it. Sir! Come with me. So, the idea is you put this bit on your wrist. This yeah. is actually a transmitter, and there's a receiver next to your computer which goes into a standard interface. You wiggle your fingers around, and it interrupts a beam of light between the two, which enables you to control things on the screen. You're, get, you're getting the signal, and you can just about play a keyboard purely by interrupting beams of light. Right, guys, do you uh, remember the film Minority Report with Tom Cruise, right? OK, imagine I'm Tom. Well, don't, you, don't you say anything. <laughs> Remember, Tom Cruise had that sort of virtual screen where he put his fingers up there and he moved things around. Believe it or not, with this, the iPoint presenter, I'm about to show you exactly that. It's incredible technology. It uses infrared light housed in this box here. Actually, there's also a computer and a projector in there, so the device itself is a lot smaller than this and will soon just be a USB device. You can see how I've got a desktop with a bunch of things on it. Imagine the web pages or pictures or whatever. I just move my finger in. It's going to grab that branch picture there. Look, bring it up. That noise is my finger reaching the point where the light is bouncing off my fingertip, going back down here and being picked up by two cameras. Two, because it's a kind of stereophonic system, so it actually has a sense of my finger in 3D space. I can bring another finger in, move it around. I can put a frame on it by moving it up over to here. Hang on. Isn't that great? 
Right, guys, this is called the MyToby. This is a computer that allows you to operate it, communicate and interact with the screen by simply using your eyeballs. Can I have a volunteer, please? Now, there's a camera down here and four infrared sensors that give the software the information it needs to work out exactly who's looking and how they use their eyes. And there you go, that's plotted David's eyes. Now, can you write for me Gadget Show by simply looking? What David has to do is make sure that that red circle goes all the way around the G and the E before he looks away. Can you see that? See, it's so quick. Now, if you want to hear what that says, allow it to speak. Gadget show. And I think, ladies Gadget and gentlemen, show. that's amazing. <laughs> Don't you think that's incredible? After we'd shown off our gadgets, we left the focus group to get properly hands-on and truly interface with the tech for a while, so they could make their minds up about which they like the best. I don't think it's fully developed yet, but once it is there, I could see a lot of practical uses for it. It could be fun for games and things like that. It is one thing to look out for in the future. It's a good concept. Ideal for people who can use their hands. Really interactive, there's lots of uh, uses for it. Oh, I think it's quality, it's um, easy to use, the interface is amazing. I enjoyed it, the best one out of the lot. OK, chaps, it's time to vote now for your favourites, so only one vote each. If you like John's light glove the best, raise them high. It's going to be another one of those. <laughs> sorry, I know sorry it's going to be about one that. <laughs> OK, Jason's minority report pointy finger thing. That's it, yeah. Sorry. Oh, I've got quite, quite oh. a few there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, nine. Good show. Good, yeah. OK, and for my Toby, for controlling with your eyes, two, three, four, five. Oh, nice. So Very this good. week's winner on the focus group is... iPoint Presenter. All right. It's going to try and just turn the volume up on YouTube. Stop controlling me. Hi. <laughs> you made me do it. Right, time for another break now, but after that... Susie and John compile our list of the top five <laughs> office warfare gadgets you can buy. <laughs> And our Jason test drives the very cool dirt surfer. Hi, and welcome back. Now it's time for our top five. And this week, John and I have been engaging in a spot of office warfare. Yes, we've been testing gadgets that allow you to attack and irritate your work colleagues without ever leaving your desk. Mostly by firing stuff at them. So, sit back and enjoy our top five office warfare gadgets. John and I gathered together an enormous variety of office warfare gadgets to put to the test. Stuff specifically designed to be fired or lobbed from desk to desk. Oh, yes. Like that. <laughs> from simple-looking bricks to top-of-the-range USB missile launchers, the aim of them all is simple, to let you attack and irritate any work colleagues within range. Right, our first test is an essential one. It's about range. We need to know just how far our gadgets can fire their payload. Let's be honest. If you can't hit the person on the other side of the office, then there's really no point. So, in this Ooh. office, John's going to stand in this corner. Yes. OK, and then he's going to fire the gadget over to this corner, where I'm going to stand and observe and not be fired at, John. No. And the ones that don't hit this wall won't make it through to the next round. Mm. So this is about how far they can go. OK, ready? Right. Go. Yep, we took it in turns to fire each of our 18 gadgets across the room. Ooh, yes. easy! And it soon became clear that the simpler, more traditional weapons were more effective than some of their high-tech rivals. Aim. Fire. Oh, that's a complete and utter failure. Some of the gadgets were quite sophisticated, rather than being purely brutal. Yay! But to get through to the next round, they all had to reach the wall. Yay! Ooh. Elegant design was no advantage when it came to military effectiveness. And our beautiful wooden machines oh, no. turned out a bit... well, wooden. Oh, rubbish. Well, that's failed. Eventually, wow. nearly half had failed to hit the opposite wall, and so they hit the bin instead. So, we're down to a top ten, but this is not a top ten, it's a top five. So we've come up with another test. Accuracy. Our second elimination round was all about hitting the target. Weapons that miss are pointless. And you certainly wouldn't want to be so way off that you hit the boss and got sacked. Oh, that's pathetic, isn't it? That was here. In our test, if we managed to score a direct bullseye, then we scored three points. Bullseye! <laughs> Two points were awarded for striking the outer circle. Ooh, yes, yes. Yes. And if we hit anywhere else on the target, we got oh. one point. <laughs> Oh, 
Each of us had three attempts with all of the weapons, and the gadgets with the highest scores would make our top five. Once again, our more technically advanced gadgets proved to be less accurate than their simpler counterparts. Ooh. Yay. Ooh, yeah. Then, once all the weapons had been tried and tested, their scores were totted up, and the five that had made the least impact on our target were consigned to the bin of history. So, we found our top five office warfare gadgets, but now we need to know which order they come in. So, to our final test. And I'm sorry, John, but this is all about pain and annoyance. Ooh. Ready? Yes. Ugh. Ow! Ow. <laughs> <laughs> right, so here are what we believe to be the top five office warfare gadgets you can buy. At number five, it's the remarkably pleasant air zooka. Ooh, it's lovely and ticklish. At four, it's the fireball gun. Mm. Number three is the highly realistic foam brick. Ooh, that's pretty annoying too, actually. And number two is the fireband elastic band gun. Ow, that is <laughs> annoying. But at number one, our most annoying and painful office warfare gadget is the crossbow. Ow, ooh, blimey, that does hurt, that. <gasps> I'm really sorry. <laughs> I never realised that was such a good shot. I am sorry, John, because it was quite painful, wasn't yes, it? Yes, I haven't worked in an office for a few years now. I had no idea it could be so hazardous. I've never worked in an office, but it would be hazardous, <laughs> wouldn't it, if you worked in an office with someone like him? Time now for the final part of this week's Trains, Planes and Automobiles Challenge. Yeah, you'll remember in the first part we tested multimedia phones by blogging from stunt planes and I won that with a Nokia N82. Yes, you certainly did. Next up was Trains where we became train spotters uh, to test night vision goggles and I won that part of the challenge. Yeah. And finally we came to the automobiles part of the challenge and this involved us, well, testing what's become one of the nation's favourite gadgets really, hasn't Undoubtedly, it? Undoubtedly. You know, we spent 340 million quid in the UK alone last year on this particular technology. Yep. We are, of course, talking about in-car sat-navs. Sat-navs have become one of the most popular gadgets you can buy, offering relief from the stress of route finding and map reading. Recently, prices have come down and down, and now you can pick one up for less than an iPod Nano. Turn right. So, what's the best entry-level sat-nav you can buy? Well, that's what the final part of this week's challenge will decide. I reckon it's a TomTom Tom 1 3rd edition. TomTom Tom are the market leaders in in-car sat-nav and they've come out on top in all previous Gadget Show sat-nav tests. This entry-level model has a 3.5-inch touchscreen, but only comes as standard with British maps. For Europe, you pay extra. I've gone for the cheaper Magellan Roadmate 1200. It also has a 3.5-inch touchscreen and comes with full European maps. To test how easy our sat-navs were to use, Susie and I were set the task of inputting a destination while being driven very quickly around the track at Silverstone Rally School. The one who completed the task fastest would be the winner. Three, two... So, first up, Susie with the Magellan. Oh! Come on, little Magellan, so I'm going to switch you on first. That's amazing! Fast switch on speed is vital for these things. There's little more annoying than waiting for your tech to turn on. The Magellan took just five seconds to switch on, then it was on to entering the address. I want to enter Birmingham. B. B. At this point, the screen proved just too small and I kept it in the wrong keys. More expensive sat-navs tend to have bigger screens, but for some reason, manufacturers think that entry-level machines have to be smaller, and that makes them a lot less easy to program. This was taking ages. M, come on, M. This is a disaster. <laughs> Often, it's the passenger who programs the sat-nav once you're on the road. So this test, though extreme, is a perfect way of showing up any flaws in the device's usability. One big plus for the Magellan was how clear the screen stayed all the way around, despite some very bright sunlight. Birmingham, thank God for that. Finally, I'd got the address in. Yes. All I had to do now was wait for it to calculate. Come on, calculate, come on! This is ridiculous, right? Stop! Is that it? Wow, that's the most fun I've had with a sat-nav in my life. 
It had taken Susie two minutes and six seconds and she'd stopped 20 metres shy of the start-finish line. Hello. The gauntlet was well and truly in the dust for me and my tom-tom. Ready? Three, two, one, go! go! OK, I'm pushing on. The tom-tom took six seconds to come on. That nav is on, right, press the screen. One second slower than the Magellan, but still very acceptable. On to programming the address. Oh, my God! First of all, right, let's try Birmingham. How am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to do this? Just like Susie, I had problems with the size of the screen on the Tom Tom. The keys are actually slightly bigger than they are on Susie's Magellan. No, I pressed all the wrong buttons. But in the bright sun, the screen was more tricky to read than Susie's, and that was causing me big, big problems. No! I don't believe it! B oh my god! Oh! M! Yes, Birmingham! Praise the Lord! I'm into Birmingham! Where am I going? I finally got the address in, 30 metres short of where Susie had stopped, but I still had to wait for the processing. This was going to be very tight. Buffering! You know there's a forest there, don't you? I love the woodland creatures, but I don't want to meet any right now. Buffering, I know she's beating me! I know she's beating me already! Stop! <laughs> I'd lost. It had taken a whole ten seconds longer than Susie to get my Tom Tom programmed. Oh my God. Beaten. 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 Victor. To a pole. Victor. Victor. Find the Perry. So Mia and my Magellan won the first part of the challenge, but now we're going out onto the public road to see which sat nav is best at guiding us to our destination. Are you ready in the blustery wind? I'm ready. Come on then. The rules were simple. This was a straight race from Silverstone to the Gadget Show Studios in Birmingham. A journey of just over 60 miles. We had to stick to the speed limits, observe all the laws of the road, and crucially, only go where our sat-navs told us to go. You ready? Yeah, you ready? Yeah, I just said I'm ready. All right, well, let's go then. Oh! Right from the off, our sat-navs chose different routes. And before I'd even gone a mile, my Magellan had got me confused. While on the screen the arrow said I had to go right, the voice was telling me something different. Bear left. It was telling me to keep left. So I did, and then by the time it's almost turned right, I'd already gone into that left-hand lane. It was too late. Now I'm on the wrong dual carriageway. The Magellan did recalculate very quickly, though, and told me I'd have to make a U-turn after a couple of miles. Great! Five minutes wasted, and I was still less than a mile from Silverstone. <laughs> Susie going the wrong way meant that she was now going the same way as me, the right way, according to my Tom Tom, which was giving me clear and concise instructions. After a couple of minutes, I was making my U-turn at the next junction on the dual carriageway, and that, it appears, confused the hell out of Jason. There she goes. That doesn't bode well, does it? Where's she gone, then? Our sat -naps clearly had different routes in mind for us. This was going to be a very interesting race. My Magellan was taking me up the M1 onto the M6 and down through Birmingham from the north. Whereas my Tom Tom was taking me up the M40 onto the M42 and then into Birmingham from the south. It was going to be tight. That's better, isn't it? It has to be said that for the rest of the race, both sat navs performed perfectly. Both screens were clear and easy to see, and all the instructions were spot on. So, in 1.1 miles, I'm turning off for the M6 to go towards the sparkling, glittering metropolis that is Birmingham. After the best part of an hour, we were both in Birmingham traffic. It was very close, but because we were approaching the finish from opposite directions, neither of us had any idea how the other was doing. We're very near now. We're very near. Come on, Bass, shift it! Yeah, Truth. Right. Then you have reached your destination. Oh, no, look, there's a red light. No! Yay! <laughs> what took you? What took you? Yay! Oh. The Magellan. Me and my Magellan won the challenge. Do you know what? I, I just got to say, I was right behind you, wasn't I, when you pulled into that car park at the end? Yeah, all right, he was pretty I mean, close There was a me. metre behind us. And your Magellan did make a mistake, whereas the TomTom -tom didn't. Well, it made a small mistake, but recalculated very quickly. Okay. I arrived at the car park first. Yeah. And don't forget, it was quicker to programming while we were rallying. Should we call it a draw? I think that's fair, actually. Yeah, it is, because we would both recommend these entry-level sat-navs, wouldn't we? Both. They're both really good yeah. and both little great. 
Time for a break now, after which you'll see me, a great big hill, and this ridiculous piece of technology. Welcome back. Now, as you might know, I'm a bit of a skateboarder, I like my rollerblading, and I often get asked to uh, test drive uh, dangerous technology on a gadget show. I normally know when they're lining me up something potentially lethal because I come into the office and they all start being nice to me. This happened last week. Came in, they offered me a coffee, they asked me how the kids were, said my new cardigan was nice. Two days later, I was on that. This is a dirt surfer. It's a mashup between a skateboard, a BMX, and a mountain bike. And its sole purpose is to get you down grassy slopes like this as quick as possible. It's made of some very high tech materials. The body is lightweight aluminium. This board here is fiberglass, and it's even got a sophisticated disc calf brake. Now, all this is fine, assuming, of course, you can get on it, go down the mountain without falling off. And that's the problem. Dirt surfers are built purely for speed. And I'll be riding the very latest and fastest bad boy, the Flexidec Pro. It'll go down these hills at over 40 miles an hour. So if I get it wrong, I'm likely to be gaffer taping my bones back together by the end of the day. The ultimate test of a dirt surfer's talent is to ride this awesome mogul field, packed with bumps, jumps, and stuff designed to push your skills to the limit. But before I was allowed anywhere near that, I first had to prove I could actually stand up on the thing. Then I'd need to prove I could handle hurtling down the 150-metre hill on it at speed. My teacher and judge would be dirt surfing expert, Andy Packer. How's things? All right? Yeah, I'm good. Looking I'm forward fantastic. to it. Fantastic. I'm just hoping that I don't look like an idiot. It's the same as riding a bike without your hands on the handlebar, oh, OK? Cool. All right. The more speed it holds, the, the easier it's going to be to stay on. I'm going to need you to put your right foot into this strap, all right? OK, got it. Now, you're going to push the board like a skateboard, OK? Right. You're going to need to take about three or four strides with it. Yeah. Get a little bit of momentum behind you. Yeah. And then you're going to have to get this foot into that strap as accurately <sighs> as you can, all Blimey. right? That's the hardest bit. So, are you up for it? I'm, I'm, I am so up for it, mate. Good stuff. Amazingly, and I promise you, I haven't cut out 18 shots of me falling over and looking like a prat, I actually got it right the very first time. Top stuff, well done, Jason. Hooray! <laughs> hey, how about that? Spot on, first Good work, time. Man. Good work. I proved my credentials to Andy, and he said I could move straight on to the big slope. You're joking me. We'll give it a go, mate. Like oh I said. my God, this is ridiculous. What am I doing? Have you seen the state of that slope? OK, this is it, Jason. Top of the hill, mate. OK, go for it, Jason. Keep those eyes up, mate. Keep those knees bent. Sorry, I didn't hear you. I just thought I'd get off and... <laughs> Attempt number two. Balls out. Here we go. <laughs> OK, it's a slow process. Attempt number three. More of a gradual turn, Jason. OK. Move, move. Yeah. Yay! I got it! And as I gain speed, the rest of the dirt surfers join me on the slope. Woo! This was getting fun. Yay! I was doing 37 miles an hour, Woo! but it felt like 137. Awesome speed! Ah! Oh, woo! That was just so cool! I was feeling confident, and Andy reckoned I was ready for the big test. They call it the border cross hill. I call it the really scary bumpy slope where I thought I was going to die hill. Ah, man, just lost my ball. <laughs> Completely lost my balls. I don't want to do it. I'd already achieved more than anybody expected of me. I just haven't got the right bottle. Here, you know this seemed utterly insane. Oh. It had all come together. I was going to do it. <laughs> Woo! God, this is scary. Oh, my God. In just a few hours, I'd become a dirt surfer. Yay! <laughs> So how difficult was that to learn? Strangely, it's like riding a bike with, with no hands. 
Like, really? Like he used to do in the high street when I was like 16 to try and impress the girls. Yeah, you've got a good centre of gravity there as well, haven't you? Thank you. Little legs. Could you see it through these jeans? Uh, yeah. What? Your little legs? Do you want to have a try? I want to. Look, you think you're brave? I'm going to try it with my heels on. Go for it. Right, okay. Careful. Hang on, yeah, hang on, I've got, I've got you. Yeah, no As problem. I don't want you to see another accident, okay, and ready? that's the end of the show for this week. Okay, here we go. Ready? Yeah. Off you go. See you next time. Go! Oh,